In Learning Objective 2, we're going to look at uh, some features of common and preferred stock. What, what exactly is a common stock and how is it different than a preferred stock? Common stock is equity without any priority over dividends or any priority in bankruptcy. You're just a common stockholder. Uh, I have a sample share here of uh, Oneida Petroleum Company. This is a certificate, stock certificate from 1925. And uh, it, uh, it's very interesting in that in the old days, you used to get a stock certificate just like this with the number of shares listed on the front, 25 shares of an Oneida Petroleum. This certificate will be mailed to you in general. And if you want to cash it in, you had to look over on the back and uh, sign the back and authorize it and then send it back to a paying agent. Uh, in some cases, I used to deal with Fidelity or Charles Schwab or a company like that. So physically send the stock certificate back into them signed and then they would cash your check. And it might take a week or two till you got your cash. Nowadays, these stock certificates or, or uh, proxies will be uh, put in your account and uh, these things are sold instantly and the cash might appear in your account in a day, two days or three days versus uh, being mailed back and forth via the old stock certificate. So it's much more efficient these days. Um, shareholders are uh, residual owners. They elect directors who in turn hire management, who uh, hire and fire uh, people to carry out their directives. One share, one vote uh, is the rule of corporate democracy. The golden rule of corporate democracy says that he who has the gold makes the rule. So the more shares you have, the more voting influence you have. Two types of voting these days. There are straight voting where uh, one share, one vote and uh, you can vote all your, cast all your votes for uh, one member of a board of directors one at a time. That's called straight voting. A new model is cumulative voting where you can vote all, all your votes for uh, one member of the board of directors if you want to. And all the directors are elected at once. And that's kind of a, a new way of doing things. Um, you need one over N plus one per, uh, percent plus one share to get yourself to guarantee yourself a seat on the board of directors. So let's see how that works um, under cumulative voting. And there's a good example in our text with Smith and Jones. Let's try and understand it. Currently, four directors will be elected for one, two, three, four. So N equals four. Four will be up for election. Uh, Mr. Smith and Mr. Jones would both like a seat on the board of the directors. The question is, how many shares do they need to own to have a seat to guarantee themselves a seat on the board of directors? So. Uh, Smith has 20 shares to begin with, Jones has 80, and obviously in straight voting, Jones would win every seat. You elect each director one at a time, and it would be 80-20, 80-20, 80-20, 80-20. Jones would win all the seats on the board. Smith has no chance. However, in cumulative voting, uh, there is a possibility that Jones can get on. We'll have to see how many shares uh, Jones or Smith needs to guarantee himself a seat on the board of directors. So the way we work, cumulative voting, we take uh, the number of shares that you own times the number of directors to be elected. So Smith will take his 20 shares times four votes and gets a total of 80 votes. Jones has uh, 80 shares. We'll multiply that by four votes. So Jones has 320 votes, total of 400 votes in the total pool. Now, what does Smith need to guarantee himself a win? One over N plus 1% plus plus one share. So. Smith will need uh, one over four plus one, so one fifth, turn that into percentage, that's 20%, times 400 votes available. 20% of 400 is 80, plus one share, 81 shares. So uh, Jones, or Smith will need 81 to guarantee himself a seat on the board of directors, no ties included. Uh, back to the original uh, slide, you know that um, Jones will, knowing that Smith has 80, Jones will use 81 of his votes on every one of the positions. He'll only have 77 left. And uh, in this case, Smith would win a seat on the board 80 to 77. However, there could be a four-way tie. If Jones uh, wants, to, uh, wants to cause some uh, confusion, he could vote 80, 80, 80, 80. His 320 votes would be split evenly across all four directors. Smith would... Uh, select 80 votes or put forward 80 votes and you'd have a four-way tie. So, uh, to, But to guarantee a win, you need 81 votes and that's what this uh, calculation does for you. Uh, very often you'll see that staggering happens on boards of directors. Even some of your local volunteer organizations like Little League and our local Little League here, we do staggering where if you join the board of directors, you're on for three years. And that um, increases corporate intelligence, uh, keeps some people on the board who know what they're doing versus electing. If you have 10 
uh, directors, you elect everyone new every year, then it's everyone's trying to reestablish how to do things each and every year. So by staggering, you allow some of that uh, built-up intelligence to stay on the board. Um, staggering also makes it more difficult for a minority shareholder to elect a director uh, under cumulative voting. For instance, if you elect uh, nine directors each year, uh, you only need one over n plus one, so one of one tenth or ten percent plus one share to uh, remove the board of directors or to get onto the board of directors. So it's very very small percentage of the votes. Whereas if you only elect two directors per year, you need one over n plus one, one over two plus one, one third or thirty three and a third percent plus one share. So it's more difficult to staggering makes it more difficult to vote in a majority of new uh, owners, uh, new directors. Proxy voting is one way that you can um, put on a proxy fight. If you're unhappy with management and what they're doing in the uh, business, you can uh, send in your votes via proxy, start a proxy fight using the proxy form that you see here. Um, it's basically like a Scantron. It's a granting of authority. Proxy is granting authority to vote your shares, uh, someone, to allow someone else to vote your share. For instance, I send all my proxy votes into National Financial Services Company, which is a branch of Fidelity Investments, and they vote my shares for me, rather than me traveling to the annual meeting and putting my hand up and voting my shares of stock in all cases. Don't have time to do that. So we can send them in in the mail. Or uh, these days, you can go to proxyvote.com and uh, put in the secret code that uh, you'll get from Fidelity and that allows you to vote your shares right online. So it's very, very convenient. Uh, very often there are uh, classes of stock, different classes of stock like A, uh, Class A, Class B, Class C, and so on. And uh, primary reason we do this is to uh, control the firm. For instance, the Ford company has Class A shares, Class B shares, and uh, Class B shares are for voting purposes, and that allows the Ford company to have uh, to maintain a majority control of the votes and, and uh, you know, management, managerial decision-making uh, by just having another class of stock. Some other companies that do that are Adolph Coors, Comcast, uh, Wrigley, Ford Motor, and so on. So you may see some of the officers with uh, a small um, percentage of uh, shares but have enormous voting power as shown in this table. Uh, Messrs. Brin and Page have done the same thing at uh, Google, and they have Class A shares, and they have uh, for the general public, and Class B shares for company insiders like Page and Brin. Uh, each Class B share has 10 votes, so they still wield an enormous amount of decision-making power through their stock ownership in Class B Google shares. Shareholders, what, what does a share of stock entitle you to? Well, it entitles you to share proportionately in dividends that are paid. Uh, to share proportionately in assets if uh, less liabilities um, in the liquidation of the company, and also to vote on matters of great importance like a merger, acquisition, that sort of thing. Usually done at the annual meeting, there are special votes that are held periodically during the year if a matter comes up of great importance that uh, the company needs stockholders input on. Dividends are another topic of interest to shareholders. Uh, some stocks pay dividends, some do not. Usually high growth firms plow back from chapter four, you remember plow back or uh, put their net income into retained earnings. Uh, some companies pay dividends. Uh, usually older, more established companies who have more cash sitting around uh, will, will often make that decision, management decision to pay a dividend. You do not have to pay a dividend. That's a management decision, as I said. Uh, unless you declare it, it's not a liability of the corporation. But once declared by the board of directors, you must pay it. Uh, payment of dividends uh, is not in a business expense, so um, is not deductible as interest expenses with uh, uh, bond coupons. Uh, dividends are paid from after-tax profits. They can be paid in cash or stock, and they're considered ordinary income by the IRS. So hence, double taxation. The double taxation feature of the corporation comes into play here. Preferred stock's a little bit different. You have some priority over common stock. Still, um, in the liquidation, you're still paid after the bondholders because you're still a residual owner. But nevertheless, you get a little bit of preference over um, a common stockholder. Preferred shares often have a stated liquidation value. They have a, a stated cash dividend. So you might hear a $5 preferred um, is a $5 dividend. Uh, $100 liquidation value, and so it starts to look a little bit like a bond. Uh, is preferred stock really a debt? No, it's still stock, but uh, sometimes can look like a bond. Um, 
it has a what looks like a coupon. It has a uh, face value almost or liquidation value, but still you must remember it's common stock. Uh, some companies have cumulative dividend policies. Some companies have non-cumulative. If they have cumulative and they don't pay a uh, dividend in a particular year, maybe because of financial difficulty, they carry it forward into the next year as a rearage. If they have a non-cumulative dividend policy, it is not carried forward. Um, it goes too many years like this. Companies will sometimes give stockholders uh, some advantages. Uh, for instance, U.S. Air didn't pay a dividend for quite a while. And uh, so they gave uh, stockholders uh, two people on the board of directors to represent their interests. So you may get some deals like that if a company is having a little bit of financial difficulty and they can't pay a dividend in a certain year or two.